Good morning. Let's go ahead and get this thing started here. We have a few that are straggling in, but y'all can share with them what we go through right now, and then they'll know also. All right. For those who don't know, I'm Alan Dennis. I'm the Deacon of the Month, month of November. And we have several announcements that we want to go through. Uh, the first one that is near and dear to my heart is eating. We have a meal. Next Sunday, the 14th, Thanksgiving meal, and we have a sign up so everyone can put down what they want to bring, their favorite things. We're going to meet here at 6 o'clock. We're going to try something a little different this time. We're going to set up in here to eat. We're going to take these chairs out, put the metal chairs in, put the tables up. Voila, we now have a dining room. Um, something else that the Deacons decided they wanted to do, we're also going to host a recreation time for the children. We're going to do this on the back lawn. We're going to just gather about 4.30, and whoever shows up will get out there and play. We may just run around and vent steam. Who knows? But we'll have some things planned for them. But at 4.30 next Sunday, come on in with the kids and uh, leave Mom at home to prepare the meal so it'll be good, okay? Just bring the kids up here. We'll get them out of mom's way so we can go ahead and get it all taken care of. Okay. White cards for visitors and prayer requests in the pew in front of you. Um, there's an About Us pamphlet also for visitors in there. Offering envelope if needed. Okay. And then back to your worship guide. Uh, Table Talk magazine is available now out in the North X. Uh, it is free of charge. Feel free to pick one of those up. Also, today is the International Day of Prayer for Persecuted Christians. Um, please continue to pray for the persecuted church. A free issue of the Voice of the Martyrs magazine is available for you in the Narthex also. Um, the 13th of November, Operation Christmas Child. All of the uh, goods have been purchased and are sitting waiting to be packed. So come join us. At 9.30 on the 13th, uh, we'll have a light breakfast, and uh, if you have any questions, Leah Harper or Jill McClendon can help you with that. Um, let's see, men's Bible study Thursday nights at 7, and continue to pray for the Pastor Search Committee. We have received uh, multiple um, candidates. We're reviewing them and hopefully picking one soon. We'll see. All righty. And uh, I think that's all we have. Good morning. morning. Have a few things that uh, we wanted to mention to y'all from uh, the session meeting this week, things we've been hearing from y'all, things we were concerned about and wanted to, some things we want to change and uh, some things we will add in, in the future, as you will see in some of the coming worship service. So number one, communion. Um, hearing from some of you, we have, the session has decided that we're going to go back to the once a month, the first Sunday of the month for communion. And uh, so, so uh, just remember that as we come in, uh, please take the time, prepare yourself for communion. The first Sunday of the month, we are returning to that, that Sunday only. Also, the fellowship time. So we've kind of, we've kind of weighed out what everyone's been saying, and we've kind of uh, come to a uh, to a place uh, that can bring everybody together, I think, we hope. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a fellowship time starting two weeks from now on November 21st. We're going to return to the fellowship time. But the fellowship time will be from 10 to 10.30. Sunday school is moving from 9 to 10. Okay? Wait a minute. Right. Okay. Okay. Fellowship time will be from 10 to 10.30. Sunday school will be from 9 
to 10. Okay. It's funny, in my brain, I heard myself say that. So my wife's back there going like, and Mark, Mark here too. <laughs> so, all right, is everybody clear on that? Have I made that as confusing? Has I made that as confusing as I can make it? Okay, the other thing is something we, uh, that, the, uh, that we've been talking about, the session's been talking about for the last couple of months is we, we believe that it's time once again to nominate and elect elders. Now, regardless of how things have been done in the past, what we should do and what we are going to do is all of you will take the time. I want you to read 1 Timothy and I want you to read Titus. And I want you to look is what is required of the elders. And I want you to bring to the session, you can, you can either introduce it to me, to Mark, to Steve. Let us know the names of men that you think would be qualified for elder. And so after these men are, after we, we talk to these men, they do want to serve as elder and we see them as qualified what we'll do is we'll present them to the congregation, and then you will elect the elders by your vote. This is the way, um, you know, it's normally done in the Presbyterian Church, and we want to make sure this is returned to that so that you, so we, the congregation, can choose our elders. So is there any, any questions about that? So... Yes, you will vote. We, when you bring us the nominations, the session will go through them. We will talk to the men that, that are brought to us, and then we will, we will you know, look to them, talk to them. We will come up and say, okay, these men are qualified. These men want to serve. And then we will present them to the congregation, and the congregation will decide if they go into office. Is that, is that, I know, is that, is that, got it? Is that clear for you? Okay. Any, any other questions about that? Okay. Steve? And please excuse me, I still don't have a jacket. Um, <laughs> I have two reasons now. One is I just found out I was going to be doing this here you know, 15 minutes ago. And the second excuse is that it's still in a box somewhere that, you know, we recently moved. Now, it sounds bad because it's been a while, but I haven't really been looking for that box. I mean, it's, it's way down on my priority list, so please excuse my lack of jacket today. Now, you know, let's not think about a jacket. Let's not think about me wearing a jacket. We're here to worship the Lord, and we have uh, this wonderful God who is glorious and just and uh, worthy of our praise. And so I want us to be thinking about him this morning. And who is he? Where is our father? Our father is in heaven, sitting on his throne, sovereign over all things. So we come here to worship him. Some of us are having problems right now. Some of us have things that we are very grateful for. Um, uh, it probably runs the gambit. But we all have one thing in common, that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ that we can praise. So let's think about him. Let's think about this glorious God. And let's bow our hearts in prayer. Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yet, those of us who have come to believe realized our problem that we had sinned against you. But Lord, in your sovereign grace and love, you provided the payment for our sin. And we're thankful for that. And we're here to worship you this morning. To 
thank you and to praise you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now will you please stand for the invitation to worship. We'll be reading Psalm 34, verses 1 and 3 together. Please repeat it with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And now we'll be singing the song of praise, hymn number 94, verses 1, 2, and 3. Praise him, praise him. You know, when we come before the Lord, it's uh, especially to confess sin. If we were to come before the Lord, come before God without the offering of Christ, we would look a lot like Isaiah, wouldn't we? Be men that were undone because our sin revealed the thoughts of our mind. Everything about us would be revealed. They say we don't, no one knows us like we know ourselves, where God knows us even better than ourselves. He knows how we're going to respond tomorrow. He knows how we will sin tomorrow, the day after that. And yet, you know what He does? He loves us. He loves His people, and He continually reminds us of the promise that He is redeeming us. Listen to Psalm 103, verses 8 through 14. Bless the Lord, O my soul, in all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your disease, and who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like eagles' wings. The Lord works His righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. 
He made known his ways to Moses. He acts to the people of Israel, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Let's take time to go before the Lord and confess our sins to him. Now, as the people of God, bought by the blood of Christ, let's confess our sin together, praying the prayer in the worship guide together. Faithful God, you have rescued and redeemed us by grace to be your distinctive people among the nations. Forgive us, O God, for we spend too much time living as if we belong to ourselves and not to you and our fellow believers. Remind us this day that we are not our own. We belong body and soul to you, and we are to live in fellowship with one another. May this be our witness to a world that is hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us stand together and hear the assurance of the gospel. From 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, saying this together, Once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's good news, amen? Amen. Let's sing a song of praise. Hymn number 284, verses 1, 2, and 5.
You may be seated. At this time, we're going to continue to worship the Lord through our giving. And during the offertory, we're going to sing a song. Uh, you should have a song sheet with you, and we will sing that uh, during the offering. We have not sung the song for quite a while, but I think most of you will remember it uh, as we begin to sing it. Father, we praise you this morning because you are great, you are mighty, and because you are merciful is the reason we stand here this morning. You have blessed us with so much, we give back a portion to you, Father, that we might carry out the gospel in this community to all those around. And this morning, Father, we uh, particularly remember those Christians, Father, in so many countries, and those who are called to go to them and take the gospel that suffer such great persecution for the name of Christ and rejoice to do so. And in the midst, Father, bring disciples in in their suffering and in their persecution. 
we lift them up to you. We pray for your protection around them. We pray for those missionaries who go out to, to minister to them. May your word go forth, Father. Be powerful. Bring sinners to repentance. To bring glory to your name from every tribe, tongue, and nation. May the whole world, world rejoice, Father. Christ has come. We thank you for your mercy as it is displayed toward us. We pray, Father, that our, our worship is acceptable to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This time, Alan's going to come up. Alan's going to come up for, with the big God for little hearts. Keith's anxious to get up. So. Let's jump right in here. Who was it that Adam and Eve... Okay. Who tempted Adam and Eve? No, God didn't tempt them. Who? Satan or the devil, whichever you prefer. The devil, you like the devil's name better. It does sound a little more sinister, doesn't it? So anyway... The devil seeks to destroy the plan of God. And what is the plan of God? That we have fellowship with him. The first thing that the devil decided to do was to attempt tempt those who God created in his own image to disobey God. The devil, you know what? He likes seeing you sin against God. Okay? That's kind of a mean thing to do, isn't it? When we are tempted to sin, we must remember that guess what? The devil doesn't love us. All the devil wants to do is to keep you from worshiping God. Okay? And God loves you. He does everything he can to stop God's plan of redemption. Now, what's the good news? Jesus came, died on the cross for us, and he has defeated the devil. Okay? And with Christ, we no longer have to worry about the devil. Okay, because all we have to do is to turn to Jesus and he'll put that guy in his place. And he ate something that the devil gave him. That's right. Adam ate the apple. That's what started this whole thing. Okay, so now we're going to say a quick little prayer. Y'all ready? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this plan of salvation that you gave us through Jesus and that you uh, have conquered the devil and we no longer have to worry as long as we have Jesus with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We have the privilege of having Keith Keller back with us to bring to us the Word of God. Keith, thank you for coming. Good morning. Thankful for an opportunity to, to be back with you uh, this morning and to have uh, most of my family here. Our son, Zeke, is not uh, with us this morning. He's in California in the Air Force where he's stationed, but uh, thankful to have the rest of our family. And you were saying I was anxious to get up there. I was just coming up to the uh, batter's box. You know, I was like a, on the own deck circle there, right? Um, <laughs> getting ready. So uh, this morning, you know, I know there's an incredible risk. There's some pros and cons with with preaching the morning that uh, time changed happened last night. One is that you got an extra hour of sleep, so hopefully you're good and awake and there's no excuses for people falling asleep during the sermon time. The other problem, though, is that it's already lunchtime <laughs> on our body clock, so, uh, you know, we already have grumbling stomachs. I could hear them around me, you know, um, as I was getting ready to come up. But this morning, we're going to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And as we look at this, we're going to we're going to think about what it looks like to live out of our identity in Christ. What does it look like to live out of our identity in Christ? 
And I've asked Alan to read in just a moment, so you can stay, on, you can stay in the batter's box for just a moment, too. So we're, I mean, the uh, on-deck circle for just a minute, too. I, I've asked Alan to read Ephesians 1, uh, several verses there for us. But as he does that, you have an assignment. There's something I need you to do during this time. I need you to put your uh, listening ears on, your reading as you read along with him. And listen for what does Paul say is our identity in Christ? What does he say we have because of something either the Father has done for us, something that the Spirit has done for us, or something that Christ has done for us? So we're looking for words that would name our identity. What has God said is true about you? If you were to believe these words that Paul says to, the, uh, uh, to those who are living in Ephesus, if you were to believe those words that he says, what is true then about you that you have? So that's the, that's the first assignment. Right? So you're going to listen to what is true about us, what's our identity that we have in Christ. So for instance, in verse 1, he's going to say we are, he calls them saints. So we claim that as a part of our identity, that this morning you are a saint. You look around the room and see the other saints that are here, that Paul would call those that were in Ephesus. I believe that we have that under what Christ has done for us. So as you listen, you can also listen for past tense words. What are some of the past tense words, things that we have that are secure, that are already ours, that either the Father, the Son, or the Spirit has secured for us? Everybody with me on that? So you might come up with a list of six, seven words that you hear as Alan reads and as you read along. The second assignment is this. Which word stands out to you most significantly? Is there a word or a phrase that it feels like the Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder and say, pay attention to this one? So maybe there's seven, eight words that you hear that you would put under the category of our identity in Christ. But which one stands out to you the most that it feels like the Spirit is saying, pay attention, this one's for you this morning? All right, so two things that you're going to do, and uh, we'll do that as we listen. So Alan, if you could... Read that for us, so pay attention with those two thoughts in mind. Starting with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. Thank you. I'm curious, what did you hear? I'd be curious to hear from you. Is there a word that was significant for you out of that list? What are, what's a word that you paid attention to? Yes. Predestined. Okay. Thank you. Lavished. Abundant. You are an inheritance. You are chosen. You are blessed. You are adopted. You're a child. You are in Him. You're safe. You're secure. You're in Him. In love. You are beloved. Isn't that beautiful? You're a glorious member in His grace.
are sealed, when you're safe and secure, you are forgiven. <laughs> now, that's a tough one, isn't it? If God didn't say it, it would sound a little scandalous this morning. Look around the room. You are holy before God right now. and You are blameless right now. What else? You're in time. God's not late. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing back. To be honest, I wasn't expecting that <laughs> many words. You have done an incredible job. I, can we just allow those to sink in? Whatever words you just shared, can you just take a breath and just allow? Or maybe something someone else said that you would go, I'm going to borrow that one this morning. Just allow that to sink in for just a moment. And I'll pray for us as we jump into this even more. Father, I am so thankful for this time that we have together to bring our hearts to one another and to you. And I pray, Spirit, that you would allow these words to sink in deeper into our souls and into a visceral level, to a gut level of how we live our lives with you and towards one another this morning. I pray that you'd open our hearts to your word, that we receive it with your kindness. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So I have a privilege um, been in missions, serving in Prague, Czech Republic, and other places around the world to be able to travel to different places. In October, I was just in Scotland and uh, working with a missionary team there and some local ministry leaders. And as, as we do this, one of the things is we're invited in, we, we find that a lot of the people that we work with, this is the place that we need to start, is actually our identity in Christ. What does it look like to live out of our identity of who Christ says we are? So we often discover that ministry leaders, they, they have a lot of skill, they have great knowledge, they have talents, they have natural abilities, and they have maybe great personalities, some more than others. But one of the places that we find if they're going to fail in ministry on the mission field, that the place that they're going to fail most often, does anyone want to guess? The number one reason that missionaries come off the field early is, any guesses out there? It's the inability to get along with other missionaries. If Satan wants to take someone off the field, he doesn't have to do it through support, moral failure, uh, issues of government. All those, those are all things that are, are true as well. But the number one thing that he uses to get people off the field early is just an inability to get along with other missionaries. So when we go in, we find that it's not an issue of their skill or their knowledge or their personality or, or, or talent, but it's often a failure of the heart. It's the inability to believe about them what God says is true about them and to believe for the other people that they worked with that what God says about them is true today. They are holy, they are blameless, right? That's a tough one. Can I really believe that? about myself and about other people, and can I live out of that place towards others? I met with a guy uh, not too long ago, and I, we had just met, we were actually having breakfast, breakfast together, and he, oops, stop, that's my, I hit the wrong um, button. I set my timer instead of my stopwatch to know what time I needed to end, so, <laughs> so you'll be glad to know that I, I do have a stopwatch, but I hit it for 10 minutes instead of uh, <laughs> you know, the time that I wanted. I also dropped my notes right before I came up, so I hope my pages are in order as well. So I got a few things uh, working against me this morning, but I have beautiful faces looking at me, so I got that going for me, right? So, yeah, that's all I need, yeah. <laughs> I am chosen. I am worthy. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I was meeting with a guy, where was I in this? I was meeting with a guy recently, and uh, not too long ago, and we had just met, we were having breakfast, and he was starting to tell me a lot of things that he was doing for God, and he was just going through a list of things, and he was doing it with, with uh, you know, just a great guy. He was telling me some different things that he was involved in, some activities, and as he was sharing, I just, I had this weight that I kept feeling in me, and I was thinking, this guy, I'm getting tired just listening to him. I wonder how tired he is doing all these great things for God, and it hit me in this moment as he was talking, and I just, I went into prayer for him as I was hearing this, and I thought, 
Father, what are you hearing as you are listening to this guy share all these things? I wonder what he's trying to do by telling me all of this. And I looked at him and I said, I don't know how you're going to receive this. This might sound a little odd, but I, I, think, I think there's something I would like to share with you. And I looked at him. He looked at me kind of odd, waiting for what I was going to share with him. And I said, I, just, I don't know if you can hear this or not, but God is not disappointed in you. I looked him in the eyes and I said, God is not disappointed in you. And he began to weep in this restaurant that we were in together having breakfast. And I just sat there. I was surprised by his reaction, but not really. And after a while, he looked up at me with a lot of tears in his eyes. And he said, but he should be. But he should be. The number one reason that missionaries fell on the field when we go to work with them is their inability to understand what God actually says about them. And as we work with them in this, uh, I want to give you a little bit of a taste of where we often start with them. And this is a place we start. It's here in Ephesians 1. And the list of words, can I really trust that this is who God says I am today in these things? It's helpful as we think about this is um, to look at the Old Testament. There's the, the use of the word banners. When, when God is talking about banners, we see this first uh, in the tabernacle, you know, when the, the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and they go into the wilderness, they build a tabernacle and they would camp around the tabernacle and they would set up the banner. So if you're in the tribe of Dan, or stand back here, if you're in the tribe of Dan, then you would be under the uh, banner of Dan. You would set up a banner. So that each tribe, if you're under the tribe of Judah, you would have a banner that would say Judah and you would camp under that banner. So it was a big part of their identity of who they are. And in one of the battles, you might remember Moses in chapter uh, in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. After the battle, Moses says, the Lord is our banner. And if you look at the use of banners in battle during, you know, throughout time, you know, the units would go out, they would march under a banner. They would have their identity of who they are. What is their unit? What is their, squad, their, uh, their team that they're on? What is the banner that is there? Sometimes it would have a name. Sometimes it would have just an image, maybe a bear or an eagle or something like that. And so they would march under this banner. And Moses is saying the, the name on our banner is the Lord because the Lord is fighting for us. We are identified by the Lord of who he says that we are. We see this in other places uh, throughout the Old Testament as well. But we also know in battle... When things are confusing, if you get separated and there's smoke or there's confusion and you get separated, you can look up and find where you're supposed to be. You can go home to go back under the banner of where uh, your identity. In Psalm 60, verses 4 and 5, David says this about the Lord being our banner. He says, you have set up a banner for those who fear you that they may flee to it from the bow. That your beloved ones, we mentioned beloved earlier, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation to your right hand and answer us. So David says for us that the banner, that you will set up a banner for us. We can come back home under you uh, when we need to. In Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah is talking about a future day, a day when there's an incredible promise that the root of Jesse, talking about Jesus, will be a banner that will be lifted up in the those that are his that have been scattered among the nations will be able to see that banner and come back home and rest under the banner of who God says we are. Everybody tracking with me with this? These banners were played in a, in a very important role, the banner of our identity. In Song of Solomon, we see that uh, a phrase that is very famous uh, for us because of different worship songs. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Song of Solomon 2, 4. His banner over me, how did he name me? He named me as beloved. So it's helpful to think about these, this word banner, especially when we think about our identity, and we can look at this word banner as we come back to Ephesians 1. What is the banner? How does God identify us? What is the banner that he holds over you? What do we come back to that we hold on to? What's the banner that God holds over us? So when you look in Ephesians 1 in this list of words, so many words that you're able to give this morning, chosen, lavished, delighted in, saved, blessed, full of grace, 
incredible words that we can say. These are the banners. This is what God holds over us that we can come back to, that we can rest under. So one of the things that we do with mission leaders is we'll ask a lot of times, what, um, how do you know if someone in ministry is significant or not? How do you know if a missionary is significant? How do you know if a person in, is a leader in the church, how do you know if they're significant or not? How do you know if a professional baseball player is significant or not? Looking at salary issues right now? How do you know if someone's worth of that? How do you know if someone's significant or not? Thoughts? How do you know if someone's in missions or in ministry or a church leader? How do you know if they're significant or not? By their fruits? Thoughts? I need you to answer some things because I have to take a drink of water. It gives me time. Yeah. I think one of the key ways we can, we can look at that is, is, did Christ die for them? I mean, I think fruits is a good one. We'll look at that in just a moment. Did Christ died for them. Do you think of a more defining way to define someone as significant as that Jesus Christ died for them? That makes someone pretty significant, does it not? So why is knowing that so important, though? Why is knowing what our banners and knowing our banners of identity, why is it so important? We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5. If you have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 5 or a device, or I'll read it. You can listen along. 2 Corinthians 5, we'll start in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 14. And I want you to listen, how might Paul answer this question? Why is knowing our banners of identity so important? How might these words from Paul answer that question? What does it matter that we know that these things are true about us or not? Turn in verse 14, it says this, for the, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he lived, I mean, he died for all, that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We're talking about Jesus has died for us. His love compels us. It controls us. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, you know, I think you know, if you hear preaching very much, you hear was the therefore, 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 since Christ has died for us, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. So what do we see when we look at other people? If we look at them in the flesh, what we'll see is something very different than chosen, holy, blameless, loved, lavished, significant. What do you see when you look at others? Well, for me, I base, when I look at someone else, how do I know if they're significant? The way I answer that is, are there an obstacle in the way I want my life to be lived, or are there an asset in my life that I want to live? Are they an obstacle or an asset? How do I know if they're significant? Do they cooperate with my life going the way I want it to go, or do they not cooperate with the way I want my life to go? Right? That's a fleshly way to view someone. But we don't regard people that way any longer. We look at them through the lens of how Christ looks at them. So continuing in 2 Corinthians, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, present tense. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are righteous. As you read through this and we think about how do we relate to other people who are in Christ. So why is resting under the banners so important? Resting under the banners of who God has called us uh, to be and who we are. We say as we look through this, first of all, I would say because God longs for you to know his whole heart for you. God longs for you to know his whole heart for you. In other words, he longs for you to be reconciled to him, to his heart. If you do not know his heart for you, you cannot give his heart to others. 
Are we with me on that? If you do not know his whole heart for you, if you have not received his heart for you, it is impossible to give his heart to others. We receive and we give as a flow. We're ambassadors of this message. We receive his whole heart, we give his whole heart. In other words, here's the point that I want to make if you catch this. Whatever banner that I'm resting under, whatever banner I'm resting under, is the banner that I will hold over other people. You cannot hold a banner over someone else that you are not already under. I just need some heads nodding or something to make sure that you're with me on this, all right? Whatever banner you are resting under is the banner that you will hold over other people. If you are resting under the banner of, I'm not enough, I'm a failure, I'm a disappointment, God should be disappointed in me, it will be the banner that you hold over others as well. The invitation is to come and rest under the banner of how he has named us. If I am moving either towards people to get them to agree with what I long to hear that God has already said is true about me, and then I will move towards them to get them to cooperate with me in that. So I either move towards others to get them to give me what Christ has already said is true about me. I will move towards others to get them to agree or to manipulate or to control in, in order to get them to give me what Christ has already given me. There's two words that I think are very helpful in this. It's the word for or the word from. The word for or the word from. I will either live from a place of rest under who God says I am, or I will strive for using people or circumstances Whatever is available to me outside of God, I will use those things to help give me what God has already said is true about me. I will either trust or I will strive. I will either live for or I will live from. So I can go into my job situation. If I'm living from a place of significance that I believe that God has already spoken over me that is true about me, I'm chosen, then I can move towards a job situation where maybe there's a promotion on the line and I can trust I'm already significant or do I begin to strive and need that job to do something for me, to say something about me. With me on that? Or it could be in a financial situation. I'm living for money to give me the peace that Christ has said I already have. So what's the energy level that I move towards people and resources with? Or maybe it's a relationship. I need this relationship to go a certain way in order for me to feel chosen. So when you offer your love to another person and they reject you, what do you do? If I'm at rest under the banners, then I long for them to come under the banners as well. If I'm not at rest under the banners, then I will use and try to manipulate through language or body, you know, through uh, body language to get them to cooperate with something different. How do I live? Do I live from a place of chosen or do I move towards that? When I was in high school, there was a, a young couple in our church uh, they were dating, they just started dating, and they're one of those couples that you look at and you're like, this is dangerous. You know, like they're, all, they're, they're a little too much into each other. Anybody have a couple in mind? Just maybe you can picture someone, we'll judge them together. Um, they, they were walking across the parking lot, and you could just see, you know, and, and this, I was standing with an older gentleman, and we were watching them go across the parking lot, and I think both of us were kind of thinking and feeling the same thing. And after a moment, he turned to me and he goes, there goes two ticks and no dog. <laughs> Two ticks and no dog. Right? They're both trying to suck something out of each other that neither one of them really have. <laughs> I've seen a lot of relationships that are kind of two ticks, no dog kind of relationships. How do I use, move towards other people to manipulate others or circumstances to give me something that they were never meant to give me? Am I moving from or for? So how do you know which one you're living in? It's a little hard, right? Because we still need jobs, we still need finances, we still need relationships, we want to feel connected. How do I know which one I'm actually living in from moment to moment? And here's, I think, two ways you can really know. One is, how do I view others? How do I view others? What's the voice and the tone that's in my head when I think about other people? The number one way to tell that you're arresting under the banners of who Christ says you is, is how you see others. Because remember, whatever banner you're at rest under is the banner that you see other people through. It's the banner that you hold over others. Whatever banner you hold over yourself is the banner that you hold other people over. We'll say more about that in just a minute. Let's continue in Ephesians. We'll jump to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. 
One of the things that we're going to learn here is we are not in neutral territory. We are at war. Paul will remind us even more so in Ephesians chapter 6. He goes through the, uh, uh, you know, God's armor that we have, he, that we are in a war, that we are in a battle. We're not in a, a battle of flesh. We're in a spiritual battle. We heard it this morning. Evil has a mission statement in the children's time. Satan's mission statement is to kill, steal, and destroy. So we're reminded that here in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You're not in neutral territory. We are at war. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You notice how much wrath there is in the world these days? It's a lot of anger. A lot of anger. And Paul reminds us that evil is hunting. The battle is actually strongest at the root of our identity. Where is evil hunting the hardest? I believe it's at this place right here. What's the number one reason missionaries come off the field? Where does Jesus say, you will, the world will know that I exist and that you are my followers by you know, the, your love for one another, how you relate, how you relate. Then when you talk about fruit, this is the fruit. It's how you relate. The fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. How are we relating? And we will not relate well outside of resting under who God says that we are. We cannot relate well outside of the banners. So as we look at this and we think about his number one attack is going to be at the core of our identity. The battle that is happening right now is the battle for your heart. For you to believe and trust that who you are is who he says that you are. And that who you are relating to is who God says that they are. So how do we do that? We can pay attention. The number one weapon in the battle that he uses is relationships. It's in the way that we relate. So we are not under the banner of wrath. That is not our identity. So which banner are you resting under? Here's how you tell. Pay attention to the words and the tone of wrath that enter into your mind towards yourself and towards others. Here's the easy one really quiet in here right now. <laughs> Here's an easy one. Anytime you hear the word idiot come out of your brain, whether you think it or you say it, the eye roll, the shake of the head, and idiot, number one, that's a great indicator that you might not be at rest under the banner of who God calls you to be. Because when you're at rest under the banner of who he says you are, then you see others through that same lens. After I wrote that last statement, pay attention to the words and tone of wrath that enter your mind towards yourself and others. I paused right after I wrote that statement, and I thought, I wonder if I have a good example of that. And I thought about a, uh, someone that Rachel and I are working with right now who is feeling the wrath of someone else who claims to be a believer. And I thought, oh, yeah, that, here's a great example. And you know what? If I had an opportunity to talk to them, I'd know what I would tell them. I would tell them that they need to, and I just stopped and started laughing. I was like, well, that was fast. <laughs> I went from them to me really fast. And I thought, what is it that I long for in that other person? Is it for them to come back under the banners? Or is it for me to show them how smart I am? I was hoping for a gotcha moment, as opposed to an invitation back to the banners of who God says they are. We'll pick up in verse 4, but God, who are the most beautiful words in all of Scripture, right? But God, Paul is going to call us back under the banners. You're not children of wrath. Let's call us back under the banners. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. By, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing. It is the gift of God, 
not a result of works so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I have a new heart that longs to rest under the banners of who Christ says I am and move with the Spirit's power towards others to invite them to also walk under their identity. You have a new heart that longs to rest under the banner of who God calls you and names you of your identity of who you are. And you long, as with a new heart, to move with the Spirit into the life of others and to invite them to rest under the banners of who God has called you to be. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We now have access to heaven's perspective when we relate to others. Catch that? We now have access to heaven's perspective when we relate to others. So when I'm talking to someone else and I'm I'm starting to feel myself amp up or maybe lawyer up in my mind or begin to see them through a certain lens, I can pause and I can think, I wonder what heaven's perspective towards this person is right now. I wonder what God says about them. When the Father and the Son are having a conversation about this person, what are they saying? And can I join in that conversation and believe for them? We have been created by God's good pleasure with the desire to live in relationship with him. That is who you are at your deepest core. You have a desire to relate to him. And if that's true, if your desire is to relate to God, that's your deepest part of who you are is the desire to relate with God. Then the question can be asked in any conversation, how does heaven view this person? Trusting that at their deepest core that they long to relate to God as well, regardless of how you're experiencing them in this moment. So what happens when I go into heaven's perspective, I'll hear one or two voices. We'll kind of close out with this thought right here. I'm going to hear one or two voices. I'm either going to join the voice of the advocate, what is the son saying to the father about this person, and can I join with Jesus as an advocate on their behalf? Or do I join the voice of the accuser? What tone do I take? Do I join accusing or do I join the advocate? Are you with me on this? I need more head nods to make sure that people are hearing me. Okay. So let me invite you back. I just want to look at chapter two again and just we're gonna I'm gonna read some thoughts that stand out to me as I do this. And we'll go through these quickly, but I want you to listen. Let me invite you back to the advocate's voice for you. What is the son saying to the father about you this morning? So we're invited back with Paul to God's rich mercy. We're invited back to God's great love. Even though we live in a world that is filled with brokenness and broken relationships, you are alive with the same aliveness as Christ has in the resurrection. You have received grace. It is yours. Christ has purchased for you your righteousness. You are saved. You are safe. You are secure. You are raised up. You are seated with Christ. God longs for you to receive his immeasurable, rich kindness. You are delighted in, lavished in. You are his. You are significant. Those are true about you today. They are true about you on your worst day. Why is this significant? Because whoever you're in conversation with, if they are in Christ, it's true about them. You think about someone maybe you're in conflict with or that you're worried about. Would you invite them to God's rich mercy, his great love, understanding that there is an evil is hunting to draw us into broken relationships, but you are alive. They are alive in Christ. They have received grace. Christ has purchased for them their righteousness. They are safe. They are secure. They are raised up. They are seated with Christ. God longs for them to receive his immeasurable rich kindness. They are delighted in. They are his and they are significant. Whatever banner we rest under is the banner of how we will see other people. And when we see other people outside of this, then the invitation for us is to stop and pause and think, how am I resting or striving 
am I living for or from in this conversation? Can I join heaven's perspective as I now relate with God? We're going to take communion in just a moment, and I can't think of a better picture of an invitation back to what Christ has done for us, that we are receiving for ourselves his blood that was shed for us and his body that was broken for us. And it's a really interesting scenario in communion when we look at the Corinthian church, is that those that were in conflict was a sure sign that they had not really truly received his body and his blood. That makes sense. Not that it's not true. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about our, where are we at rest? And I invite you back to hear these words that, uh, that are spoken that we named this morning. What words were significant for you in that? Maybe those are great words to hold on to as you take communion this morning. The invitation back to his grace and what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for this opportunity to bring our hearts to you this morning. And I pray that you would, again, Spirit, that you would allow these words to sink deep into our hearts, that we would become people who are at rest under your love for us. The incredible grace that you've given us, that we are today, right now, through your eyes, righteous. And I pray that we would receive this time in communion with hearts that are thankful and generous with your love. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. What greater banner than the Lord's table to serve under? I believe that's one of the greatest ways that we can relate to God and through Christ. For on the night that Jesus was portrayed, he took the bread. After he blessed it, he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. He then took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. Take and drink. Paul adds words, as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. The scriptures require that we examine ourselves before we take of this meal. So, if you will, please bow your heads with me and have a moment of silence, and I'll close with a prayer. As we take these gifts representing your life that was broken for me, I remember and celebrate your faithfulness to me and to all who will receive you. I can't begin to imagine the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, yet you took pain for me. You died for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the extravagant love, the unmerited favor. Thank you for your death gave me life, abundant life now, and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, I too receive these gifts in remembrance of you. Amen. We're going to um, remember that this is the Lord's table. That if you have your belief in Christ and have come to him, then it's appropriate to come to this table. If you're still searching for something afterwards, talk to myself, Alan or Steve and we will pray with you. So now, if we'll all stand, and as usual, front of the room to the side table, back of the room to the back table.
the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ taken to his own. If you'll bow with me. Lord Jesus, what a privilege to be able to come before your throne of grace and partake of these precious sacraments. In remembrance of you, atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for paying the enormous price for my sins so that we may be forgiven of all faults and receive your indwelling life. May we never forget the enormous price that was paid on your on you for my behalf. May I never forget that I have brought with a price that you have bought with a price the precious blood Lord Jesus Christ. May I live for you from this day on knowing that your body was broken and your blood was spilt for me. Thank you in Jesus name. Amen. And now we receive today's Lord's benediction. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Did we have a song? Too? We're supposed to have a song. Go for it. Want to do it? <laughs> okay. Go for it. All right, everybody stand and sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. It's number 184.
have to apologize. I went back to old memories. In the Primitive Baptist Church, which I grew up, we always had communion, and it was our custom to sing a song and leave. So I guess I flashed back for a minute. May the Lord be with all of you as we go into today's world and help, help us be under his banner. Amen.